So today's exercise will be about policy gradients or to be a more specific stochastic policy gradients. I think in today's lecture you had deterministic policy gradients. So when you have a policy which has to be estimated because your action space is continuous or continuously, you will have to somehow calculate gradients or you can calculate gradients over your policy so that you can, for example, use a backpropagation algorithm and uh, neural networks for your estimation of your agent. And today we will um, apply stochastic policy gradients and st that means we will have st a stochastic agent in the end and we will apply it on this um, lunar landing environment here which basically we have this small I don't know spaceship in purple and we have a side engine which you can see which is uh, visualized by these particles here around it when they are when you see particles it's using the side engines and by a main engine which is here on the top uh, on the bottom sorry so you also see particles here and basically our task is to land on the moon or to land inside this uh, small area on this uh, yeah so to call moon and yeah today i want to ask you some questions during exercise so i will try to mix it up a little uh, i hope some of you will participate or maybe all okay so first of all maybe uh, an interesting question would you say in real life you have a moon you have a moon lander you want to land on the moon would you use a stochastic policy you say no why not Sounds like a good take. So the answer was uh, it might be dangerous to have a random number generator decide on expensive equipment and humans. Any other take about this? Yeah, so basically in when dealing with technical systems, you assume that there is an optimal control available. So you don't have some kind of stochastic environment which can just randomly change. Instead, if you are able to measure everything, you assume there is an optimal action and you take it deterministically. And honestly, I wouldn't trust if I knew um, the plane I'm on is landing randomly or <laughs> you, you just have assumed this random policy is right. You just, I, I wouldn't feel too sure either. So usually you wouldn't apply stochastic policies on um, on a technical system, um, which is why in this exercise we will train in stochastic policy, but we will also try after training to apply it deterministically. Okay, so here we have our stage vector, which we observe, which our agent ob observes, which is the position in X and Y axis, the velocity in x and y axis, um, the angle in which the agent is in, the I think this is this angular, angular velocity it has, and we have some um, binary state values, one of the le left leg has ground contact L0 and one of the right ground leg has ground contact L0, and we have a very interesting action space in, in, in the continuous case. So um, we have two actions and the one action um, goes from minus one to one and from minus one to zero the agent does nothing or the not the agent but um, the spaceship and from zero to one we use our available power of the main engine from 50 percent to 100 percent and for the side engines it's even more interesting from it's also from minus one to one and from minus one to minus oh five it's um 50 percent to 100 percent of the available engine power of the um left side ah uh, no of the okay it seems of the right side from um and from point oh five to um from oh five to one 
it's 50 till 100% of the left engine power. And in between, so from minus 05 to 05, you also do nothing with the side engine. So there's a lot of space available here in which nothing happens if the agent is um, using the action here, which could, could be problematic because it's difficult for the agent to learn that there's such a big ground in which nothing happens. Uh, but it could also be good because, or uh, easier to learn, we, we don't really know, because if only the zero value would be doing nothing, then it would be extremely hard, maybe even impossible for the agent to get the zero action out. So it might, so it might be a good idea to have a small corridor in which nothing happens. However, I would assume this is quite large here, so maybe this is too large. Uh, if any one of you wants to try, uh, you can um, also change the action space yourself and uh, yeah, apply it differently to see whether this uh, improves learning. Okay, so maybe let me see about the reward function. We want to land like this spaceship here very cautiously. If you land too fast, we will see that later in the video, you see the legs are kind of bending to the right and left and that's a crash and we don't want to crash. And we have a reward which is defined by whether we have a um, successful landing, plus 100 or not, minus 100. Um, we don't want to use too much of the main engine, which gives a negative reward. And yeah, the problem is solved if a return of at least 200 is reached. That's a side note here. If you want to have more information, you can look it up in the, uh, from the source. Okay, so what do we do? I think the first two cells are, that's also not an exercise, just if you want to visualize the environment and just some importing here. So I will not execute anything here because the notebook itself took me I think 12 hours until it was finally executed and I tried it on my PC and my PC was even slower than this laptop so um, it takes quite some time. I try not to break anything here yeah, now. Um, so first of all we want to use the reinforce algorithm um, to solve this problem with a stochastic policy. So what we have first here that should have been introduced in the last exercise, so I will not explain anything about this anymore. We have some automatic um, uh, feature generator here using RBF, RBF sampler, so that we don't have to do any feature engineering. We could do it nonetheless, however, we use these automatic features here, and you can just use it yourself too. Um, and what we want to use is the Gaussian for the stochastic process for the agent, the Gaussian multivariate um, distribution, which looks extremely complicated here. I don't know if every one of you has a technical background, comes from electrical engineering. This is looking more complicated than it actually is. And I think you do also don't really have to understand too much of it, just how to implement it in code. Um, What's important to understand is that the Gaussian um, multivariate distribution has um, a mean vector for each variable which we want to apply, so for each action. This is this mu of theta here. And we have a covariance matrix. Um, this, what is it called? I'm not, sigma. I'm not that great with the Greek letter. So that's sigma, and this is also estimated. And then you can, this is our estimator, and then we have to calculate um, the loss using this stochastic distribution by, I think it's called here, by taking the natural logarithm. It's, um, it's e I think it's quite easy to calculate the logarithm of this um, distribution, which is why it's also nice to use. Okay, so I think we also have a task here already, right? Ah, oh, no. Ah, yes, okay, we do, we do. That's also what you have to do here. We have, uh, this is our distribution, and we want to have a function, log likelihood Gaussian, um, which calculates the 
natural logarithm of our policy. And maybe about the general structure of the code here, our policy is basically um, some quite, uh, quite, of, quite a big neural network um, with um, a hidden layer of 400 layers, which is, I think, which both networks use, and then two different output layers um, for the mean and for the um, 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 variance or covariance, for the covariance matrix. And we are, let me see on my screen, we are only estimating, so we are assuming that our variables are not correlated here. So basically what we do, maybe first with the means, we are calculating the means here and we are clipping them to minus one and one, one so that they don't get too big. And I guess that's also, yeah, because our action space is also just only from minus one to one. And then we are calculating our sigma, which is also just uh, two values. And then we generate our covariance matrix by setting um, the diagonal to zero. So, maybe let me see the sign again so that you understand. Okay. So usually your covariance matrix would have the variances of your variables itself and also some covariances. So basically how much they, or it depends also how much your variables correlate with each other. And in our task, we assume that these covariances, which would actually be the same value, are zero, so that our actions are perfectly uncorrelated. So this is not the most realistic modeling because you would expect that when we fire our main engine, this might also have something, some dependency on our side engine. However, the reason why we, why we set them to zero is because afterwards we want to have deterministic actions. And if we want to have deterministic actions, we only want to apply the mean value. And if we have correlations here, then we couldn't just use the mean to have uh, deterministic actions because our actions would be entangled. So that's why we put them to zero here, if you wonder when reading this code. Okay. But apart from that, we also clip, clip the sigma so that it's between a very small value, but not zero and one. The reason why it's not allowed to be zero is uh, because we calculate um, the inverse of our covariance matrix. And if it becomes zero, then it becomes numerically unstable. I think even uncalculatable at some point. So that's what we try to uh, not have here. Okay, so far, so much for our models. Um, and now for the solution of the log likelihood Gaussian, what we have to do is we take the natural logarithm of the Gaussian function. And since we have um, a division here, and in, 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 when we take a logarithm of a division, then we take the logarithm of the first part minus the logarithm of the second part. So we take the logarithm of this, of this uh, exponential function, which just removes the exponential function, and then we subtract the logarithm of what is seen down here. And basically that's all what we, what we see down here. So we have this, so this function needs x, the mu uh, and the sigma, and then we subtract uh, mu from the, from the state, from the x, that's this part and this part. And then we can, just use 
minus 05 times the transpose of this times uh, the inverse of our sigma times the subtraction here, which is just the first line. And the second line is then um, uh, depicted here. So we are uh, calculating the determinant here and then just taking the negative logarithm of the square root of 2 times pi uh, to the power of the dimension. This can be seen here, 2 times pi to the power of the dimension times the determinant here. And then we just return the sum of the two. So this is just the first task. Sure. So the x in the function here is our action view? Or? Yes. Okay. Ah, I said state, right? Yes, it's the action. It's the estimated action. So yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe we should change it to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, that's quite confusing, right? Using here you and we have it a little later. We have this again where we just uh, called the wrong variable names. I'm sorry, that's quite confusing. Okay. So using this loss, uh, this loss function, or this not this loss function, this uh, logarithm, we can now uh, implement the reinforce algorithm, and then we can use to, uh, in order to update. Maybe I can show you the algorithm in order to update um, our weights later. We need this natural logarithm of our policy. That's why we calculate it here. That's all of the reason. Then we will later have to calculate the derivative, derivative of it. Okay. So, what? Oh, okay, I jumped. So what we do here now is I think this was, ah oh no, this was not implemented. Okay, so this is just a possible implementation here of the reinforced algorithm, but you can also implement it differently, obviously. So what we have here, we have, once again, as always, or maybe the algorithm is quite short this time, it's a Monte Carlo-based algorithm. That means we will, first of all, take the whole episode, run through it, and afterwards we update our weights. So we have here for the episodes, generate an episode following the policy, and then we do our update. And here, just as always, structured as always, and as it also should be in your exam task, so these exercises are quite important for how you should implement it, is if you have a feature visor or something how you, which you can call on your state, do it first. So you will want to have the, your state, uh, you, you want to have the state which you, you've added your features on. Then you just use your policy. In this case, usually you would have action equals to policy of your state. Now we don't have the action right ahead, but a mu and a sigma. And we get the action by using this multivariate normal function, which is just the function we've seen above, the Gaussian. Then we have our action. Using the action, we can um, take a step in the environment. We can see whether our environment has already terminated. Um, and in the case of Monte Carlo, since we are only updating after the whole episode has ended, we have to remember our states, actions, and rewards, which we have done on our way. That's why we are saving it here. And we are also saving the log likelihood at each point in time. Otherwise, we would have to save mu and sigma at each point. Yeah, and so fine, so good. I think the rest is just visualization. And after the episode is done, this code here is quite cryptic. Um, <laughs> I tried not to explain it in detail. Maybe you should calculate it on paper yourself, whether this really equals the pseudocode it does. But here, basically, we estimate g. Uh, we calculate g, so this line, and then we do our weight update. Um, this part with alpha and theta plus alpha, this is always done by our TensorFlow optimizer, so we don't have to do this ourselves. When we calculate optimizer apply gradients, we already have 
this theta equals theta plus alpha times blah, blah, blah. So you only need the right hand side after alpha. And yeah, what we do here is we take the G returns and uh, which is G and um, um, multiply it with um, the minus props logs, uh, which was, let me see, which, yeah, so which was basically our error here. Uh, and the negative, because we want to maximize it, I guess. I'm not exactly sure at the moment why it's negative. I guess because we want to maximize it. Oh, no, because we want to, because in reinforcement learning, we want to maximize it, the return, but in, in when calling our optimizer, we want to minimize the error. So we have to take the negative of it. So that's why there's a minus. Yeah, and that's already the implementation <laughs> already. This is our implementation. And when observing the, um, the rewards, which were obtained during training, I think we have an extra cell here. What we can see, it's quite a lot of variance, which we can observe. So it's, uh, it's not that stable. However, what we can see when applying the moving average, we start here at around yeah, maybe minus 200. And in the end, we slowly, we are only in the positive, um, uh, on the positive side. However, if you remember 200 means we have solved the task and yeah, more often than not, we have not solved it. If 200 is, uh, is our, um, let's say ladder here on how do you say our roof? Um, so based on this, I have once again a question, maybe one of you can answer it if you have followed the lecture really uh, well. <laughs> do you have any idea what we could do to reduce the variance here? Uh, I think we could uh, improve this baseline. Yes, good. I, I didn't even expect that. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> so you have learned about a baseline, which you could uh, subtract from so that you do not learn the Q value, but instead learn an advantage function. And in that case, you would have to estimate a value function, which means you would need another neural network. I think, I'm not sure whether I have the newest version here. This seems too long, but here, yeah, here we are introducing a baseline. And then in the end, you have here Monte Carlo policy gradient with a baseline, and then you have two neural networks which you have to update. And um, yeah, this reduces variance and keeps the bias uh, without adding any bias, which is great. So I will, I cannot execute it now here now to visualize it. However, I did make some videos beforehand. And we now have, oh no, I have a second question. Ha, huh, great. <laughs> so basically we have a stochastic policy now, which we can either execute uh, stochastically, so by taking the Gaussian uh, multi multivariate distribution, or we could use it deterministically. So by just taking the mu and neglecting the sigma. What would you expect to be better? Maybe I, I'm just interested. I will, I will just, without any, just it by intuition, who thinks deterministic is better? Just get your hands up. Okay. So, and who thinks stochastic would perform better? <laughs> okay. And you, you don't have an opinion <laughs> on intuition? No. Okay. So, I was on your side. I thought deterministic should be much better. And I was proven wrong, which is very surprising and we should discuss it uh, after. It's Monte Carlo. Yeah, let's start with the deterministic. We can watch some videos. Can you see it? So I will repeat it. This was a crash. So when you see the legs are going to the, to the outward, but we do not expect our policy to be perfect. We've seen, oh, that was a fast crash. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, let's let's watch through video five. We have the time. Yeah, that was a crash too. Uh -huh. At least it's fast. <laughs> yeah. So we see it's going into the right direction. However, it's not so well. And let's see the random policy. Okay, ah, oh, that was almost a landing. We see, I think it's a crash though. Ah, that was also too fast. Let's observe again. Yeah, now it's being more cautious. Yeah, yeah, that, ah, that was a half crash. Let's see. Okay, that was a crash again. Mm. Oh, we have a landing successfully, finally. Maybe in the last one. Ah, cautious, cautious. Okay, we have got two successful landings versus zero. Maybe one was even, let's say, two and a half. And one was one leg successfully and the other was not. I, I, I hope you are surprised. I was very surprised. I thought deterministic would obviously better. Does anyone, so we brainstormed too in our group about what could be the reasons about it. So does anyone have maybe a feeling what could be the reason why the stochastic policy is performing better? This is after training. After training, yes. Can you train with stochastic parameters? Sorry again? Can you train with it being stochastic? Yes. So when you turn that off? Yes. You optimize for the stochasm of um, like reducing the perturbation. Yeah, that was one of our intuitions too. So basically what we do, we just is we just train an agent all of the time to being stochastic, stochastic. And so it learns to be perfect being stochastic. However, uh, when we turn that off, it might not be that great again. So, however, it's still confusing because in expectation, we have a Gaussian distribution without any covariances. So in expectation, you would always expect the best to be the mu action. So in expectation, since you're in expectation, apply the mu action. However, what, what another intuition could be is that maybe the agent is sometimes in states where it doesn't exactly know what to do. So the variance it assumes is kind of like its uncertainty. So it doesn't know exactly where am I, what is a perfect policy. I, I make a high sigma. That means I will apply, apply a, um, an action in a range, in a range, and then I will see where I am afterwards, and maybe that's a state which I can better control in. And so maybe this randomness is indeed because of that helping it. It was surprising for me too. <laughs> okay. So the next and yeah, I think also the last task was. Um, to now apply actor critic with GD zero targets. So in actor critic, you have an actor, which is um, our policy basically, which is applying the actions or which is estimating the actions. And we have a critic, which is um, estimating the Q values, which is telling the actor how well is it doing when it is applying an action. So the action is learning from the critic what a good action is, and the critic is learning from the experience the actor is enabling what, which state action combination is good or which is not good. And so in this case, we can just use instead of doing Monte Carlo, which is quite slow, we have seen, or let's say sample inefficient. This was not slower. This was actually much faster than the TD zero code. Uh, but sampling wise, if you cannot, for example, if this was real life, you couldn't have so many spaceships be destroyed. Um, so sample efficiency is quite important in reality. You don't have a lot, you might have a lot of time, but you don't have a lot of um, experiments which you can conduct. So TD zero is much more or let's say stepwise updates are much more sample efficient. So maybe let's go to the lecture. Where do we have this TD0? Ah, yeah. So here we have the pseudo code for actor critic with TD0 targets, where we have yeah, our policy once again estimated, but we also have our critic estimated, which is this 
the value omega here, however. Okay, so we have, what do we have here? We have once again, we have a critic which is quite large, two layers of 400, uh, two hidden layers of 400 neurons. We have an actor which is quite large with 400 neurons per hidden layer, two of it. And the actor is once again um, estimating a mu and a sigma. So this is actually the same as before. So nothing has changed here. Nothing uh, has, yeah, nothing has changed from above. So what do we have? Here we start again. And without any change, once again, we take, we get the featured vector, we get the mu sigma from the actor, we apply, we get the action by using the stochastic policy. Later on, you will not have to do this anymore when you use the deterministic policy gradient. Uh, you apply the action, you get a done signal, uh, and yes, you also obviously uh, apply the feature visor to your next state. So this is always the same. Just remember it by heart what happens here. This is always the same in reinforcement learning. Maybe not if you work on parallel execution or something very sophisticated. However, for this course, this is an um, algorithm which you should apply. Okay, so actor critic with PD0. We have our episodes and now we do some update at each time step. So what we've seen, we have done our steps here. So we have observed the next state. Ah, oh, yeah, we can see it here. We apply the action and observe the next state and the reward. And then we do some updating our, is it called sigma, I guess? Let me see in the code. Delta, it's a delta. I, I knew. Uh, so our delta here is just um, the reward which we have observed plus gamma times the estimate of the next state. So um, our critic is estimating the state value of the next state. Oh, okay, so I said wrong. Our critic is estimating not the state action value, but the state value. There are different algorithms. Sometimes the critic is estimating a state action value. Um, I think you've learned maybe today in DDPG. Um, and minus the estimate of the actor, uh, of the critic of the current state. So what we observe, what we have here in code is, we have the critic estimate the value, it's called this value, <laughs> it's the value of this state, and then we have the next value, which is a critic of the next state, and delta is then reward plus gamma times next value minus this value. So this is our expected value. So basically that's already again, since this is our expected current value, our critic loss is also the value. And the action is, uh, the actor loss is, where do we have it? Here, gamma uh, to the power of k times this delta times this derivative, which we have which we don't have here. Let me see again, have I? Yeah. So, ah, it's, it's happening later, sorry. Okay, so we, yeah, 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 okay, I remember. So I, I was just confused. So we are now calculating the gradient here. So this gradient of the actor loss is, this is not the complete actor loss here. So we calculate the gradient here and we apply it manually, not with using tensor flows. Apply, we do not use an opt optimizer here this time. And that's why here, when updating our um, actor rates directly, we use delta again and times i, and I guess i is then gamma to the power of k, I hope. Ah, here it's 
gamma times i. Ah, okay, so we do, we, we update gamma iteratively. So we do not take gamma to the power of k, but at each step we multiply once again gamma with the gamma multiplication which we had before. So we start with one, which is gamma to the power of zero, then we multiply with gamma, then it's gamma to the power of one, and the next iteration we multiply with gamma, so it's gamma to the power of two. And so this gamma or this i is then gamma to the power of k, which is mentioned here. So we have delta gamma to the power of k and the derivative of, the, of this logarithm here, which was ca calculated using the gradient function here. Yes, okay, so then we have our weight updates. Maybe one question to that. Sure. Delta, why is there a number squeezed or why what dimension is delta has or why do you need to squeeze? I have not checked. So this is, uh, what is delta? Let me see how it's calculated. Reward plus gamma. Gamma is a float, yes, times next value minus this value and it's from the critic. Maybe there is an empty dimension somewhere. Okay, but it's just to remove some empty dimension. Now, sometimes when you observe something like squeeze or unsqueeze here, then it's just so that uh, the dim dimensions fit. Usually in Python, that's quite easy. Most often you don't have to do put any thoughts in dimensions, but sometimes you have to. I don't really know why. You might could even try to remove it and see whether it still executes. So I did not uh, program this part. This was already a few years ago, I guess. Um, I just assume maybe as you should, that <laughs> you need this here. But maybe you don't, you could try. I, I, at some point I also removed some of these squeezes because I thought it was uh, not needed. Okay. okay, no more questions. Then after we have updated our weights here, so we basically what we do, we get the weights before we update them ourselves. That's all the optimizer does usually, and then we set the weights. This is much closer to our pseudocode here. So we do it manually instead of um, using some TensorFlow function. Okay, and when then applying it, what we can see in the reward curve is first of all, we only trained for 2000 episodes. So this is much, much more sample efficient. However, it's not more time efficient since the execution of this cell takes forever, really. My laptop was doing its best, but at some point I had to go to bed and it was continuing work, poor thing. So what we can see is the moving average here. We also have some variance, however, it doesn't seem to be so big. And what we can also see is that the moving average goes to 200 and above. So it seems like it's able to solve the task quite reliantly. And I also have some videos to prove this instead of just having numbers. I think, yes, we once again have the execution here. I think I haven't talked about this um, at the beginning. So if you want to apply the deterministic action, you could just either, when you, uh, when you call your actor, you get mu and sigma. So either when it's deterministic, your action is just mu. And if you don't want to have a deterministic action, then you take this random distribution of it so that you've seen how it's done in code. And in this case, I've observed that the rewards were once again better when applying the random policy. However, I think on the videos, I don't see much of a difference. Maybe even that the random policy is looking a little strange sometimes. So I will start again with the deterministic here. That was quite a nice landing, I guess. Let's do once again to video five. Yeah, that was also nice. I guess I would trust this agent when flying to the moon. <laughs> And the last one, I guess, is also... Ah, 
At least we're not dead, I guess. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I, I will take that back. We are dead. <laughs> okay, so maybe uh, at least from the rewards, I could also observe that um, deterministic policies were once again a little bit worse. Maybe we just saw an example of this. Um, maybe let's have some videos of the random policies too. So, yeah, the video is continuing because it's still firing some of its side engine here, which I guess does not give a, a negative reward, I think. So it's okay that it does this, but we did not observe it at the deterministic policy. So this is rather strange. I think we can observe this in almost every video here. It's taking... Yeah, we are already at the goal and it uh, thinks it can fire more of its uh, saved fuel. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever it does till the end, it was a great landing too. And then if we don't die in this video, I think we have once again a better policy here. Oh yeah, smooth. <laughs> okay. So what we could observe is that using actor critic structure and TD0, at least for this environment and with this implementation and with this structure, it's much more sample efficient. Uh, we are reaching a much better point in the end. Even though it's a stochastic policy, we are able to um, apply it on a technical system and have quite a good performance. However, we might not want this in reality. I guess in the next exercise you will use deterministic policy gradients, which would be recommended here. And yeah, I think this does conclude our exercise. Do you have any more questions about it? Well then, I wish you a nice evening. Um, I will not hold the last exercise, so I wish